transportation system. Um, we are tired of talking. We want to move forward into action. Uh, so unfortunately, we're starting with more talking today, tonight, and tomorrow. Uh, but as Royce and James reminded us in, in his article the other day in the Star, we need to get beyond talk. And that's really where we're hoping to be. I, uh, I, I hope many of you will be coming out uh, we're going to start tonight with, with some tremendous conversations, some experts, uh, uh, some, some political commentary. Uh, we're going to start the conversation going about possibilities and options and issues, uh, get the juices flowing, and I hope, I hope many of you will be with us tomorrow at Richmond Barnes, where we continue the discussion, and coming out of that, where we're looking for action items, things, how we move this agenda forward. Um, and, 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 and we shall see, we'll, we'll do this together. Um, so, uh, my only other job other than welcoming you is to introduce our moderator for the evening, uh, who is uh, someone who probably needs no introduction, but I'll do it anyways. Uh, Christopher Hume uh, is the architecture critic and urban issues columnist for the Toronto Star, um, and uh, he's, he's been with the Star since uh, 1981. He's an award winning journalist. He's, uh, his, his book, William James Toronto View, won Toronto Heritage Award in 2000. He received a Landscape Ontario Award in 2004. In addition to his, his print journalism, he appears uh, regularly on radio and television. Um, he's, uh, and in particular, uh, among, among many things he's done, many of you will remember the 2009 uh, CBC series, Living City series that, that he hosted. Uh, it's it's a, a really great pleasure to have uh, as knowledgeable uh, and informed uh, and, and dare I say, entertaining uh, person as Christopher, Christopher Hugh to uh, to uh, moderate tonight, and with no further ado, I'll turn the podium over to Chris. You know, I, I can't tell you how relieved I am. I, when I when I walked in here tonight, they were pointing at this table over here, and I thought, oh my God, I'm going to have to sit at the mayor's table, which would have made me feel very uncomfortable. Um, but it, it won't make our other uh, panelists, our panelists, uh, uncomfortable. I'm very happy to be here tonight, and I'm keep my words simple because as Eric said, we've talked enough, God knows. Our first speaker is Bob Stanley. He's from Washington, D.C. He's an independent consultant with more than 30 years experience in transportation, transit, and urban planning with local and regional, at the local, regional, state, and federal levels. And I think I'll just leave it at that because we want to hear him, Bob. Thank you, Christopher. It's a, it's a pleasure for me to be here tonight. Uh, if you haven't suspected, I feel a little bit like I'm preaching to the choir, or perhaps bringing coals to Newcastle, however you want to, however you want to think about it. Uh, the, uh, that is to say that I, I think from a U.S. perspective that your experiences and your perspectives here uh, with uh, mobility management initiatives in Canada may be more advanced than ours in uh, the United States, and I think that's a great irony that I should uh, I should be here and, and engaging in a dialogue with you about this. And I think also your interests may be more focused as well from what I heard from uh, participation in the CUTA conference uh, throughout the day. The evidence for, for this is uh, pretty convincing. Your early efforts here in Toronto to concentrate development around subway stations, uh, the creation of TransLink in Vancouver, which uh, combines transit land use and highway responsibility on a regional scale is something we don't see uh, and wish for in the States. Uh, and the evolving role of MetroLinks here in coordinating regional initiatives to manage mobility through the big move planning and the Presto system that's being implemented. Uh, despite the obvious progress, what I would like to do is to uh, share with you a brief historic perspective about uh, how the notion of mobility management or managing mobility seems to have been crystallized in the transport sector over the last two decades. How that is, and how that history reveals, uh, as Christopher wished for, a uh, framework and an action agenda for managing mobility. At least move a little bit in that direction toward action. And hopefully that might be useful to you despite the progress that, and advances that you've uh, made over time here in the region. At the end, I'd like to pose a couple of questions for you to consider and us to, to talk about uh, as we go forward this evening. And, 
for my own sake, I expect some responses that uh, might be very useful for me to take back to my colleagues in the states. Today, the phrase mobility management is, is obviously gaining currency. However, I think the meaning of mobility management as an overt strategy or as a set of actions remains pretty fuzzy. Almost every organization that has this interest has its own particular definition. And I think some of those are short, are short on clarity and some miss a key concept or two along the way. In the U.S., for instance, we've struggled by confusing the, uh, the broader imperative to manage mobility more effectively with the more limited agenda of coordinating transit and human service transportation. Both obviously pose significant challenges, but they're not the same thing. The mobility management issue is an overarching crisis that we all have in all of our metropolitan areas. In truth, mobility management will require, I think, a number of actions uh, taken together or in varying sequences if we're going to advance the cause. Uh, adding to the challenge, I think, is the concept of mobility man the, the, con the concept of mobility management contains an implicit threat. And that threat is the suggestion that we need to change or reconsider or circumvent or redefine traditional political and institutional and modal and programmatic boundaries. And I think there's a great deal of peril in attempting to do that, and we, we see and feel that as we try to, try to manipulate traditional organizations to address this question of mobility more effectively. These challenges notwithstanding, what I'd like to do is begin by suggesting that there are three broad elements in an operational definition of mobility management. The first is the, is the integration of available transportation assets and resources, both public and private. The second is assuring, that the quality, assuring the quality of the customer's travel experience regardless of what assets are being used to serve that customer. And the third is, the, is integrating the public policies that can support efforts to enhance mobility management. And we'll talk a little bit, more, a little bit more about that later. These three tenets have been distilled from a wide range of fundamental changes in the transport sector as well as other business and industries over the last two decades. What I'd like to do is illustrate what I mean by using a few noteworthy examples from the intermodal freight industry, from package delivery, and from European transit. In the 1980s, there was a period of time that was known as the logistics revolution in intermodal freight. The traditional, uh, for years, the traditional intermodal freight business model was driven by a focus on internal operating efficiency, cost, and competition among shippers of various kinds. With each mode, uh, the operations focused on the, the assets that the individual company owned. What changed uh, in a response to sort of lackluster performance uh, was a strategic focus that shifted away from internal cost efficiencies, mode by mode, to a primary concern for the customer's experience across the whole range of services and facilities that were used to move freight. Former worldwide competitors, Sealand and Maersk, who ultimately merged, made customers their primary focus by sharing assets, including terminal ships and information. Now, this is fairly remarkable because they were hard bitten competitors for uh, most of their history. Decision makers for many years believed that working alone with dedicated assets, that sounds like our familiar transit mantra, or at least the tradition in the transit industry. Working alone with uh, dedicated assets was the way to maintain a com competitive advantage in the marketplace. During the last decade, the operating philosophy of Sealand evolved from one of being driven by the market, the competition and the cost, to an obsession for the customer. What, that, what emerged from this obsession was a new three-tiered business model. At the top end, what you have is an organization or a person within an organization who is responsible for assembling the most appropriate and most efficient set of services to serve that customer's need. 
At the bottom of this model, what you see is a whole range of capacity providers which you might call on to serve that need. In between is the addition of or the reliance on state-of-the-art information technologies that can, in real time, connect the user, the shipper, with the mobility manager or the logistics manager, in this case, with the provider of capacity. So we've got a three-tier model that suddenly emerges uh, that helps to integrate all the resources that are available to meet consumer needs. Sometime after that, the package delivery business sort of came to the same conclusion. In this case, uh, the chairman and CEO of FedEx is talking about uh, the revelation that they had. FedEx is trying to recast itself as a major provider of the very management systems that threaten the company. Working at their best, such systems would select the most logical, most economical type of transport, air, land, or sea, for delivering packages on time. He went on to say that, so now, FedEx is preparing to embark on its new strategy. FedEx is creating a unique system that will automatically select routes for an endless number of Cisco shipments, in this case. It's quite possible that FedEx system will route deliveries on, ship, on ships, airplanes, and trucks owned by other companies, even UPS. So the hard-bitten competition in the package delivery business begins to break down in the interest of serving customers more effectively, maintaining customer loyalty along the way. Like freight, the uh, package delivery business shifted away from a pure competitive model to one based on uh, strategic partnerships in serving customers more effectively. The result is a shift in corporate mission from being only a capacity provider to being a mobility manager in a broader sense, focusing on the needs of the customer. In the freight industry, you deal with a controller of logistics, in our parlance, a mobility manager, not with a capacity provider. In some cases, the, the task of providing modal capacity may be outsourced to the former competitors to serve the, serve the customer better. There are other examples of this model emerging in the transport sector as well. One you may be familiar with is the emergence of airline alliances. Right now, there are three major uh, worldwide airline alliances. Uh, Air Canada is a member of the largest of those, the Star Alliance with 27 other members, and they share codes and share reward programs and that sort of thing in the interest of serving the customer better and capturing more market share. Uh, the transit world has also undergone similar change in, uh, in various areas. Unfortunately, not so much in the United States and maybe not so much as you would like here in Canada, although I'd argue you, as I said before, that you're, uh, you're ahead of us in innovative thinking about many of these things. In Gothenburg, Sweden, uh, the transit industry uh, that was serving uh, special needs transportation uh, became an example of horizontal integration. What they were experiencing was much, was much like what was being experienced in the freight business, that there were several separate organizations who had responsibility for separate client bases and who operated or called on separate capacity providers to meet the needs of their various clients. In each of these cases, those organizations had a scheduler and a dispatcher and somebody who actually arranged travel for the client base. What they discovered was the same thing they discovered in intermodal freight, that if they combined the joint, joint or made joint the dispatching and scheduling and management activity, they can consolidate that function from all these organizations and in the process serve the clients better, uh, save the cost of du duplicative services and functions in each of the organizations, and make better use of the, uh, of the capacity that they had in the system. On a larger scale, the serving uh, the door-to-door -door need, the systems of routing and dispatching connected them, the, the mobility manager, to the various suppliers of transportation services, and you drew on drew on all of those to provide the capacity for the, your client base. The larger example uh, that a lot of people have looked at and talked about for some time because it's been around for a while is the case of 
London Transport, and in this case, London Transport Bus. Uh, they changed, they reorganized themselves uh, from being a traditional provider of capacity, that is a bus operating organization, to a service integration organization. Their mission shifted dramatically. They became mobility managers and they separated that strategic role of mobility management from the act of, of providing capacity. London Transport Bus is now a logistics center that designs and tracks and evaluates services on behalf of the customer and it's outsourced the task of actually providing the bus service to a number of contractors in the private sector. So clearly what we've seen through all of these examples in the transport sector is sort of a, an emerging paradigm. In each case the client deals with the integrated service provider in each case, the information technology is used to design, track, and evaluate the services that are being provided. And in each case, the, the uh, mode of capacity need not be provided on the dedicated assets of one company. So we begin to see the shape of a model to manage mobility more effectively. Now, around the same time, uh, this is back in 2000, Business Week, <coughs> published a, uh, a, a beautifully simple philosophical basis for considering this model. And it goes like this, the emerging strategy for the 21st century must be predicated on constant change, not stability. Organized around networks, not rigid hierarchies. Built on shifting partnerships and alliances, not self-sufficiency. And constructed on technological advantages, not bricks and mortar. So we have the emergence of uh, both a basic business model and a philosophy to begin to drive us toward an action agenda. And remarkably enough, in all of the uh, examples I went through and other, other elements of the transportation sector and businesses and industries outside the transportation sector, what we see in these shifts is uh, consistent evidence of fundamental changes across six dimensions. And this gets us to a, a framework of sorts for changing the way we have traditionally done business. What you see is a change in mission shift from simply being a capacity provider to being a mobility manager and with the interests of the customer driving the business. You see also uh, an attempt to measure the quality of the customer's experience more effectively and introduce those measures and those observations into business decisions. You also find collaboration, and this gets to the partnership uh, notion that I was talking about before. You find former competitors collaborating and across modes, across agencies, across programs and roles as well as jurisdictions. As you begin to collaborate and talk to those people whose interests you might share or meet in, in serving mobility needs, the next step is integrating a little more specifically, and that is actually sharing facilities, sharing equipment, sharing systems and functions and processes, and uh, probably most importantly, sharing resources to make sure that the, uh, the needs of the customers can be meet, met most effectively. To do all that, you also need to make some changes or advance the, the level of the infrastructure or, or information technology that's being used. And that's happening so fast right now that, that proprietary systems in the industry that we've struggled with advancing uh, uh, on a year-to-year -year basis, uh, all of that is being overtaken by the uh, access to cell phone technology, the real-time links that are being created uh, both within systems and among partners providing transportation and mobility services. And uh, the social media that's uh, been relied on by subsequent generations to uh, manage their lives. Finally, you see organizational structure change in all of these examples as well as governance changes to some degree. You see a separation, as I said, uh, of the strategic oversight and management role in mobility from the role of simply providing capacity. You also see organizations that are responsible for providing mobility adding new, uh, new skills and new functions to their organization and reorganizing them accordingly. 
the information technology alone is causing organizations to focus more explicitly and <coughs> drive that set of decisions and, and, and that management function up the, uh, up the organizational ladder. Uh, so what we've got here now is a philosophy. We've got a three-tiered model for managing mobility, and we've got the beginnings of an action agenda across those six dimensions I was talking about. But if you look only at the mobility management function here and think only of conversing and collaborating within the transportation sector, we aren't going to be successful. There is so much that's going on in, in the economy and business and governance that influences our ability to uh, enhance mobility, that the collaboration and integration that has to take place has to reach out well beyond the capacity providers and the traditional transportation agencies and interests. We'll need, as you have understood here for quite a while, uh, a different set of uh, collaborative approaches and techniques in the land use area. Same thing for infrastructure and operations, particularly on the road system. How are we going to parcel limited road space out to all the users that uh, are staking a claim to that space? Pedestrians, bicyclists, automobile drivers, public transportation, taxis, and freight services. Uh, that's a, a huge question and calls for an enormous uh, collaborative effort. Also on the environmental side, uh, environmental regulation and protection uh, has to be factored into the collaborative exercise here to uh, assure the mobility is uh, being improved at the same time and the sustainability of our, of our systems and our environment is being protected. And finally, there are a whole range of other public policies that need to be brought in in a collaborative way here, including tax policy and financing policy. So the, the outreach has, this has to be a bigger effort than uh, dealing in the transport sector or the transit sector alone. In order to, uh, in order to make this a reality, the question becomes, where do you want to start? What are the steps that we want to take first? And I'm suggesting it through all the examples that I talked through very briefly and others that we have not talked about that there are two places to start. One is to be very open and honest about this collaborative need and, and, the, and the need for integration across resources and assets. And secondly, the introduction of state-of-the-art information technology into the business. And I think, the, uh, I think we recognize the path forward in these areas uh, and you're already, I believe, on that path, whether you know it or not, certainly probably farther along on that path than I would think we are in the United States. To conclude, let me, uh, let me pose two questions. You see three here, but I'd like to skip to the second and third. First of all, the question of who should, who should, the, who should have the primary responsibility for managing mobility. It's a strategic function and question. Where should that responsibility lie in our system of governance? And second, what are the critical barriers to managing mobility more effectively? Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to do this little history lesson and to kick off our dialogue. Uh, I hope, this, I hope this little bit of uh, background sheds some light on the agenda ahead for you in the discussions this evening. Thank you very much. And the transport studies and is well known for his book, Making Cities Work. In 2005, he was made an officer of the British Empire. George, this is part of the British Empire. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's great. Uh, it's great to be here. I actually uh, I'm part of the MMM group in Canada, so I'm over here quite regularly. Um, but uh, I uh, I know I know Toronto, 
Uh, I used to be director of city development at the city of Edinburgh, which is my home city, is where I live. And I used to get a lot of experts coming to the city. And, and some of the experts gave accurate information that was quite useless to my situation, like this sign. Um, I'm going to do a deal with you tonight in that I'm going to paint a picture. What I can bring to the table is uh, my expertise and understanding of cities uh, and how they operate around the world. Um, and also my understanding of where mobility is going in the future. It's a black and white picture. You guys are the experts. You know your city. It's people that know their city. So you have to color in. So it's a partnership uh, between, the, between the two of us. One of, the first things, one of the first things I do when I go to any city in the world is walk. I walk for half an hour to an hour to surround the city and very quickly you can tell what drives the city. And the one first, the first principle that, uh, that is always the key principle to remember, that cities aren't about buildings. It's easy to think of Paris as the Eiffel Tower, or Edinburgh as Edinburgh Castle, or Toronto as the CN Tower, or whatever. Cities aren't about buildings. Cities are about people. Cities are the marketplace, and it's people that make, that make cities work. It's people also that spend money. I used to teach at university, and I used to always say to the students, cars don't spend money, buses don't spend money, trains don't spend money. It's people that spend money, it's people that give the life to the city. So as a good friend of mine, Jan Gell, a professor of urban design at Copenhagen said, you build a city so that people will love it, so that it's like a party, you just don't want to go home. And that's a good principle in, in city building. And so if you feel like, number one, as a pedestrian. That's what we tried to do in Edinburgh in the, in the 90s. Um, and it was a kind of turning that from that to, to this, that I'm the number one, then your city begins to feel and, and work well. And there's a number of ways uh, that, you, that you can do that. You know, it, it's, it comes down to, to a couple of very simple principles. There's actually seven. Called, I call it seven deadly winds. It's a long story why it's called seven deadly winds. But anyway, the first two or three I'll talk about here because it's the key to making the good cities work. Because in the 90s, um, we looked at how, why the good ones are good and why the bad ones don't work around the world. And uh, all these cities work on the same principle. Uh, we've, I've worked in Saudi, I've worked in Australia, I've worked in North America, I've worked in Europe. Um, and the same principles apply. The first thing is there's only two spaces in any city, exchange space and movement space. I owe that to a guy in Australia that wrote this fantastic book, probably out of print now, called Developing an Eco City. And that transformed my life when I was director uh, in Edinburgh. Because the city is the marketplace, and you can physically measure that exchange space. It's the boundary of the city. The people come and they bring their goods and they have coffee with friends and they do business and they go to university and they, they go to the cinema and whatever. That's the city. That's what makes the city work. And that exchange space, both private and public, and private being you know, things like your office and your house and public being you know, uh, squares and, and cafes and all that kind of stuff. That's what makes the city work. And so the first key principle is you have to maximize that space and protect it at all costs. But, and, and you know, when you look at that, a, site, a scene like this, uh, which is in Helsinki, which was pretty cold that day, although it was sunny, um, there's an interesting thing going on here. You see that? You've seen it all over the world. I've seen it in Toronto here. People that are met to have a conversation, but they sit on the same side of the table. So there's two exchanges going on that's very important to understanding of a city. There's an exchange here, but there's a big exchange here, watching the world go by, watching the buzz of the city. And that's, that's part of the life uh, of the city as well. You've got to understand that balance. We, uh, we worked in San Diego a couple of years ago. And the gas lamp, they're, they're recreating that downtown area of the city and exchange space. The gas lamp uh, works really well. And they've just, they've just taken little areas of the city and, and bulbed out and, and created little exchange spaces. This is in Little Italy. See, the road capacity hasn't been altered at all. But they've just understood that about creating money and creating um, life in the city in terms of that exchange space. And it needn't, of course, be uh, uh, all outside. It can be inside this wonderful mall that that's in the book, my, my, the book Making Cities Work. Um, you can do it in all sorts of, of different ways. But it's, it's key that you understand, the first thing is that cities work in exchange space. Second principle is transport's not about moving vehicles, it's about moving people and goods. 
basic mistake a lot of people make. It's about moving people and goods. That's what you've got to do. Why have you got to move them? Because you've got to move them to get to the exchange space. That's the only reason you need movement space, to get to the exchange space, so, so the city can work. But here's the problem, that you need to minimize that space. Because that space can only come from one place, and that's exchange space, the very thing that is life, the blood of your city. So you need to minimize that space and maximize the other space. Now, depending on how you move people around will depend on how successful you are in terms of that balance. And until we understood this, people base their, their, their space requirements too much on one mode, the private car which is an occupancy of 1.1 or whatever. And the key statistic up there that, that, that you may not have seen is look at the space required for the dynamic space of a car as opposed to the parked space. It's huge. Now, this is not political. It's not pro-car. It's not anti-car. It's arithmetic. It just does not work. You cannot make, you, you cannot make it work and get people and goods to where you want to get them to if your, if your movement system is unbalanced. And as cities get more complicated, complex and busier, as is happening here in the city of Toronto, then you find that it doesn't work. And you find that congestion increases and whatever. There's an interesting case in San Diego. They had a wonderful economic development plan. Uh, these are the figures in terms of growing jobs downtown uh, and growing uh, housing downtown. Really good plan. But the one thing the economic development people hadn't done was actually combine that with modeling of the movement that was required. And they were assuming that the, the, um, the transit share, which is 23%, if you look at these figures, then that would continue and the downtown plan would work. We actually ran their own models and, and found out that if you kept the 23% in terms of trips, and the I-5 that goes around the downtown was full to capacity, just like Don Valley Parkway and 401 and, and all these things. Um, it was full in terms of the evening peak. If you wanted all these jobs and all these people living downtown, you would need 12 extra lanes off the I-5 and 12 extra lanes on. You would need 25,000 more parking spaces and they had more parking spaces, they had double the parking spaces already of Vancouver, downtown Vancouver. And by the way, that space took most of your economic development space for, for all your, for your jobs and your housing. It doesn't work. But what does work is if you ratchet that up from 23% transit to 41%, your plan works. Simple arithmetic. And you've got to get that uh, balance. And, and people have got, of every city, this is where the colouring in comes in. What's the balance for this city in the future? That's the key thing. And getting that movement balance right between space, exchange space, and movement space. And this rebalancing, it's very interesting, is happening all over the world. It happened before, this is, uh, this is Portland, Portland, Oregon, where they took out a, the, the, uh, the road along, on the, uh, alongside the, uh, the river and created the, the park. But in places like Seoul, you may have seen this, they've taken out a 60s freeway, just taken it out. They didn't add any more capacity to the road space, they just took it out, traffic like water, found its own level and sorted itself out, and they recreated the river that was there before the freeway was there. And it's a great success. The exchange space, it's earning money, um, it's a great environment to be in, it's a high quality of life, all three, bang, bang, bang. Brisbane, uh, uh, the South Bank in Brisbane, they've done exactly the same thing. Uh, in New York, they're doing the same thing, they're just reclaiming that, 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 that movement space and just experimenting with with exchange space and seeing what happens to the retail environment and the economy. And it doesn't have to be an expensive urban design. You can just block the road with a few bushes and put some tables and chairs and see what happens. Great fun. And it, it can be, uh, it can be uh, temporary as well. In Paris, this is by, by during the week, this is, this is the freeway alongside the River Seine, an express motorway. Uh, certain Sundays and holidays, they just block it and they put some sand down as an urban beach and they just, uh, just people just use it as, as a linear park. One of the other seven deadly winds is you've got to give people things to sit on. It doesn't have to be chairs. People will, people will sit on anything. It's amazing. It's amazing what people sit on. But give them... And, and again, we, we work this out from the, a very simple language that 
you know, people come to the city, they, they, they shop and they, they have a coffee or whatever, then they get tired. Then they can do two things. They can either go home or if there's somewhere to sit and have a coffee or a beer or wherever they'll sit. That's what you want. That's what you want. You want to keep them there. So you give them places to sit. Now, we had all the same objections in the 90s from the retailers. This is the Royal Mile in Edinburgh from the castle uh, right down to Holyrood Palace. It had four lanes and we said we want to, we don't want to pedestrianise it, that was too much, but we want to reduce it to two lanes and triple the sidewalk, bring cafes out, and the retailer said, no, no, that'll kill our business. So we said, okay, um, let's close it for a day and let's have a party, good Scottish tradition. And we brought this uh, tapas bar uh, over from the uh, Netherlands and uh, you got out at the bottom, you got a tapas and a glass of wine and if you were quick, as 100% of Scots would be, by the time it came round again, you got another tapas, another drink, and at night you got a candle as well. It's very romantic. And we had a band, and we had a beer tent, and whatever. And at the end of the day, we said to, we said to the retailers, what did you think of that? And they said, well, that wasn't bad. No, that's good. Okay? <laughs> that's as good as it gets. And we said, okay, well, we do it again. So, yeah, we'll, we'll do it next year. We didn't have the fancy stuff next year. We just closed the street for three days. Then we closed it for the whole of the Edinburgh Festival, now it's pedestrians. We learned that from, from Copenhagen that you do it just incrementally. Retail turnover went up 40%. Wow, that's, a, that's, you know, that's interesting. Uh, and so the retailers were happy and the city works much better. So that's, where you, that's what you're aiming for. That's what you're aiming in terms of your city, the balance of your city. Now, What's happening in the world is that every city is going on the same development path. It crosses culture, it crosses continents, it crosses, uh, crosses geography. We've done a whole load of these uh, studies for Siemens. Uh, we've done uh, this one here in Toronto, GTHA uh, study. And uh, we've just finished one for Calgary and one for Edmonton as well. We started off with a, a mega city challenges study. You'll get all these on the Siemens uh, website. Um, and we looked at these trends throughout the world, and we found that every city exhibited the same trends, growth trends, as each other. And in fact, the same growth trends as you see here in Toronto. And what was interesting when we interviewed over 500 city leaders is that every, every city was being driven by economic competitiveness, number one, which always took precedence, like it or not. And secondly, in that context, transport was the number one issue. Mobility was the number one issue for them by a factor of three, which is surprising. Water is at the bottom. That's not because water is not important. Water is vitally important for a lot of these cities. But this is the silo of governance that goes on. That water was an, it seemed to be an environmental social problem, not an economic problem. And of course, the report points out that it's an economic problem because if you have bad water, then your health costs go up, and people get ill, and your productivity goes down. So there's a, there's a misunderstanding there, but nevertheless, that's what it was. So we took all these trends and we mapped them to the end point of where was mobility going. And this is where uh, what Bob was saying matches exactly what we found. That mobility systems in the future are going to have to be these three things, user-focused, seamless, uh, and valued by the user. Now that may, seem, that may not seem much. But let me tell you, that will revolution, revolutionize our transport system. Because what it means is we move from, as Bob was saying, an operational model to a retail model. It means that we move to individual mobility management for, for my needs, my, my accessibility needs, not for the strategic, only the strategic level. And that's the retailing component. So we're into customer relationships management, all that kind of stuff that retailers have been doing uh, for a long time. And why this, will, why this will work? Because it's a system that goes with the market, it's what people want. Personalization is increasing hugely around the world in cities. Um, it's a system that develops huge new revenue streams, as we've seen with the Octopus Car in Hong Kong, with a whole lot of value-added services. And it's a system that actually can balance uh, supply and demand, but through choice and incentive and nudge, nudging behavior rather than coercion. And that's politically deliverable, which is important. I bear the scars of many road user charging schemes, including my own city around the world. I, I believe in road user charging. I think it's, the, it, it's, it's very sound. It's hugely difficult to put in, as we find out in our own city and as Manchester found out as well. We also were asked by, by, by Siemens to come up with a snapshot of mobility index for every city in the world. And this is why every city is on the same growth trend. They're all trying to be each other. At the bottom, we're struggling to cope for places like Lagos and Dakar um, and Kolkata. 
And on the right-hand side are the best in class, the Asian cities and some of the European cities like Vienna, Munich, Hong Kong, Singapore. And then you've got a group in, of, of cities at risk. Um, and some of the Canadian cities are in there, to drive a car. What do they do? They're retrofitting transit. Because they found out it didn't work. So why, is the, why are the cities at, uh, at risk? Because these cities have grown very rapidly. And their investment in mobility and movement has not kept pace with that growth. And you've got another 50%, right? By 2031 in, in population. That is staggering. That is frightening compared with, you know, given what's happening now in the Don Valley Parkway or whatever, and that you know and experience every day. So there needs to be a concerted movement to the right, not only a catching up for this city and this region, uh, but also uh, a moving towards best in class in the future. And this report actually looked at three scenarios uh, for that that I might, I'll say a bit about later. Um, UITP in, in uh, Europe has said, okay, let's start small, let's just keep adding, let, let's just add things. They've called it combined mobility rather than complete mobility. Some other people call it smart mobility, where you've, you put parking and transit together so that you, you, you can park your car, you get transit and it's all the one ticket. You, you can add Zipcar, you can add Bixie bike, you can add holster. So it's beginning to put it together in a small way rather than this huge picture that nobody's got to yet. Nobody's got to this end state of complete mobility. The other reason why this is going to this is going to happen, I'm not sure how it's going to happen, but this is going to happen, is technology, technology and retailer trends. You you go into the, the websites of, you've got Urban Outfitters here, yeah, store, yeah. Um, you go into the website or some of the the, the the retailers. They're not selling clothes anymore. They're selling lifestyle. They'll sell you concert tickets. They'll sell you insurance. Go to some of the food stores. They've done the same analysis. They're joining it joining it up. And technology. Technology is now beginning. This, this article in the, the Global Mail yesterday, did you see it? Starbucks, use QR codes, buy your coffee at Starbucks and smartphones. And the quote at the end, we've been talking about the smartphone being loyalty and couponing communications device for probably 10 years. It's now ready to be a reality. The market is moving very, very quickly and people are adding apps all the time, like Google Wallet. Google Wallet. This is from my own city. I spent millions on real-time information for buses at bus stops. Some guy a year ago, two years ago, wrote an app for the iPhone that tapped into the GPS system of all the buses, the vehicle location system, and for nothing, I've got it on my iPhone now, you can download this app and find out where every bus is and go to any bus stop and find out where the next five buses are in real time for nothing. The market is changing very rapidly and we in the transport industry have got to think like retailers to actually, to actually take that and use it for the good of the city and the individuals. This is the system in Nice uh, that operates in four uh, mobile phone operators where it does transit, it does discounts for uh, shops and the museums and things like that. And it, you can download information on the city. If you look at parking, this is San Francisco where you can download a real-time map of where the parking spaces are, on-street and off-street. They, they're, they're varying the, type, the price of parking. Um, so it means that now you don't need all the gear on, on, the, on the street in the future. All you need, you know where the car is, you know where a stud of the road is, the parking space. You've got complete control through your mobility management system on your phone. If you've got to be a half an hour longer, not, not a problem, you just, you just extend the time. And from a city point of view, economic point of view, you say that area of the city is not doing very well. Tell you what, let's nudge behaviour and give discounts or free parking over there, and let's just balance the system. And that's that's what's going to happen in the future. And it also it, it also helps the operational problems. What is the biggest problem of Bixie bikes and the uh, Velo uh, Velo uh, system in Paris? The biggest problem is that every night all the bikes are in the wrong place. That's the biggest cost. And I saw it in Montreal, a guy with a big trailer, loading the bikes in, driving them around, putting them until, you know. Now a retailer would think, okay, that's a big problem, that's a big cost, what do I do? I incentivize. I give carbon credits or whatever to people and I keep ratcheting that up until I trigger the market to say, if you were to take that bike there, rather than leave it there, you get so many carbon credits. Oh, okay. So the customer is happy and the, uh, the, re the uh, operator is happy as well because he's solved the problem thinking differently, and that's what's going to happen uh, in the future. This is a bit of fun. You can, do, you can change behavior in a number of ways, and this is, this is a bit of fun that happened at a station in uh, Stockholm. 
It was a health thing, and they wanted people to use the stairs. Everyone used the escalator. Nobody used the stairs. So what did they do? They lay a piano key, a real piano key, on the stairs. That's all they did. And then they watched what happens. And then you've got all sorts of social behavior going on. You've got a guy doing a symphony. You've got a nice romantic duet going on. And a family time, and whatever. You know, bit of fun, but a change in behavior. Um, this is another, this is a guy at a cafe in, in Toronto here. He's just bought a screen. Great business for him, because people go in, it's raining that day, they have a coffee, they see where the next tram's coming, they might have a conversation, say, tell you what, I'll have another coffee, and there's another tram in 10 minutes. Great bit of business. Customer happy as well. And look at these figures. This is a stat, I've been 40 years in transport, I've never seen figures like this. Look at that bottom figure. 50%, up to 50% of peak hour car drivers changing behavior to not drive in the peak. That, that is astounding. And how did they do it? It was a pilot uh, in, I'm sure I'll get this wrong, Spitch, Majin, no Dutch, Dutch people here. Um, and they, they said, here's a, here's a bunch of money, and uh, if you drive out with the peak, or if you take transit in the peak, uh, you can keep the money on a day-to-day -day basis. And they varied it between three dollars, uh, three euros, five euros, eight euros to see what would trigger the market. And they, they got the trigger points where, you know, people changed their behaviour because it was value. The two things going hand in hand, and that's more than anything what I've discovered. And these big revenue streams. Look at the octopus cars in Hong Kong. Half of their revenue for the transit card is not to do with transit. It's to use it as a cash card, like the Oyster card in London here that I've got and to buy all sorts of other things, use it as a security device. It opens a whole window in terms of new revenue streams that I'm happy with to pay, to, to pay for. Um, and you just uh, make it worth your while. So, the thing that, in terms of doing is one of the key things, is that you must realize you have to hit the two targets. People won't say this, they'll say, yeah, it's good for the environment. What they actually mean is, is it good value for me? You never say it in a survey, but that's what's going on, right? Because you've done it as well. Is this good value for me? And so it's the ambulance analogy, where there's two things going on. What makes a good ambulance service? Well, strategically, you know the answer to that. I mean, you need a strategic plan. But secondly, is it, you know, what's a good ambulance service for me? Well, when I have an emergency, all I want is one ambulance at the right house as fast as possible. That's a success. So there's two questions that are going to be answered in the future of mobility. And it's this conundrum between the supplier wanting the strategic bid and the individual like me wanting the value. And for too long, and I've been doing this a long time in my life, and I've just realized it now, you know, I've been doing Vegemite plans or Marmite plans, right? You've got Vegemite or Marmite here, yes. which one? You, you know it? None. Oh, no, all right, okay. There's, a, the, there's always a lunatic fringe that like this stuff, right, in any audience, okay? But, you know, it's good for you. That's the thing, it's good for you. And so I come up with plans that are good for the city and we put them on the shelves and, and the, the, the public say, well, yeah, but I don't like it. We say, well, okay, well, we're gonna have an advertising campaign to make you like it. And they, they still don't like it. <laughs> so you, you've got to actually put the two things together and what I call the transport retail model. So it's these two things coming together. It's understanding that at the individual level, what's good for me and making my complicated life work but what's good for the city as well in terms of the economic, environmental, and social benefits. And all the bits are there. What do we need for this? We need smart networks. We need CRM stuff that retailers have been doing for ages. Uh, and we need a good pricing model. And even now, this is moving onwards from CRM to, so, to social networking. And we're, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm the wrong generation for this, but I watch what's happening with our young people in the office, my, my own kids. And it's just a world apart. And one of the things, the big things, when people uh, in social networking that they look for in terms of applications, first one there, 77% incentives. What's in it for me? What's the value? And that's, that's the market that's going on. So, you probably can't read uh, the, the letters, all of the letters, the, the, the words, but it doesn't matter because basically what this is, is the kind of model that's going to work in the future uh, for a mobility system, the kind of thing that Bob was saying. 
On the, the right hand side is all the stuff that you have now, the train operators, the bus operators, the taxis, the, the health, the education, all the things that go together for, our, for it to make our city work. On the top left are the policies that are driving this, and that's very important. Who's dictating that policy? Is it going to be Google? Is it going to be Walmart? Is it going to be the city? Very important, because that's what's driving the system, that's what they're testing the system against, and the other stuff is data coming in. In the middle is where the money is going to be made, and this is where the public sector need to get in, uh, because that's the brains that joins it all together for you and I. So every one of us in the future will have a mobility manager uh, that, that helps me and tells me where there's problems and says, you know, I know I told you to go on the train and get off at station A, but there's a problem down the line, get off at station B instead. Uh, the bus is 20 minutes, would you want a taxi rather than a bus because you're going to be late for your, your appointment? Yes, please. Okay, there'll be a taxi waiting for you. It's an extra 50 cents. Is that okay? Yes, that's okay. That's the market. That's the market that a lot of people are seeing in the IBMs of this world. And we've got to get into that in terms of the public sector as well as the private sector. So in the middle of all of that, there will be this kind of city manager that's just blending it all together. And it can be driven by economic ob objectives, it can be driven by social, it can be driven by environmental, it can be driven by an amalgam of all three. That's up to us, to, to say. But there's a business model that says, okay, at the far right, there's a whole series of revenue streams as we sweat this asset for the good of the city. And on the right, there's upfront costs. We need to find a business model that links uh, the two things. And of course, this whole thing opens up 100% of the market. So now it's not a transit card we're talking about. It's a mobility management system for everyone. So for a car driver who's uh, like Jeremy Clarkson, if you know Top Gear, who would be classified as a diehard driver, you wouldn't start with a transit pass. You'd start with a Mercedes or Porsche package that does its petrol, fuel, the uh, tolls, the license, uh, you know, whatever, road, ser road service. And then you add cycling and you add transit and you incentivize to change and trigger that behavior. Different way of thinking. So lastly, what does it mean for you guys? Well, you've already seen this. We did some, uh, well, we looked at all the kind of problems. These are not new to you. You know all of the things that are pressing in and all of the issues. Governance is always an issue in every city. Funding is always an issue. But you know all of these problems. And if you don't do anything about that with your growth, the danger is that you will go backwards in terms of GDP and the economy. And that's why the city, according to our analysis, is at risk. Uh, and that was the big five plus four. If you took the whole of the big move, all of it, we reckon that you would begin to edge right, and you begin to catch up, but you actually need more than that. Because the more you go to the right, the more integration you need, the more seamless it needs, it becomes so you don't get this situation where you have to shift buses or have two, two, two fares, whatever, as you cross boundaries. That can happen in the future. And your competitor cities will make sure that doesn't happen. And you've got to make sure it doesn't happen as well. So if you add the complete mobility concept to that, then you really do track across. So what the city needs is all of this stuff and more. Okay, it's a big price tag, but you need that stuff. You need things like the own. Uh, ex extension to, to York, to join up York Viva with, with downtown. You need all of that kind of stuff, because that, that's going to make your city work, it's going to balance uh, your city. And so when you combine, you've got all the plans, the plans are there and the plans are good. So if you look at your big move, the Greenbelt plan, the places to grow, all of this kind of stuff, you begin to see that all of this is possible. All of the stuff about building community at the local level, at the centre level. Um, of, the, of managing that sprawl. Uh, all these things that I'm not going to read to you, you can read, read them for yourself. These are all the things that you know that, that this city is going to need in the future if it's going to compete and it's going to be a, a, a place that people want to live. And if you, when you add to that complete mobility or um, smart mobility or, or whatever, then you really begin to motor in terms of that. There's one seamless system, it's value to the user, it supports the, the, the plans that you've got and all the things that I've been talking about now in terms of new funding and, and generating the individual lifestyle uh, choices. How would you start? Well, this is the kind of stuff that we were talking about before, um, where you could have pilot studies. Um, I can hardly make this out here, uh, but 
you know, these pilots about social challenges, you can go in anywhere you want, but the, the important thing is that you collapse the big picture down to the, the, the small local picture, and you focus in on that. These were just suggestions. It could be anything you like. It could start anywhere. It could start with an event, like the Pan Am Games. It could, uh, the, uh, yeah, the Pan Am Games. It could start with a university. It could start with a sports venue. It could start anywhere you like, joining that thing up, and that's what the city uh, has got to... Uh, Think oh, you've got to take governance and funding, and there's that one mobility system that has got to slot into the various things that come together for this complete mobility package technology, infrastructure, balanced pricing, uh, user led pathway, all of these kind of things. That's all going to be uh, worked out. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on that, that's how it all fits together in terms of your plans. Now, I'm not going to say what the solution is, but actually, you have got an organization here, Metrolinx, that can do that region wide. And if there's a possible model there where Metrolinx is there working with the other people like TTC in an integrated way to provide the kind of system that you guys need uh, to give that high quality of life and uh, competitive economy and clean environment that all of you want uh, for you and your kids in the future. And so, choice is yours. Is this the kind of city that you want? No, it isn't. I know that. Every, every strategic plan that I read in the world always says the same three things. We want to grow the economy, we want a healthy environment, and we want a high quality of life. But you're no different, and I'm no different. And so, if you want to get to that, then you've got to balance your exchange and moving space. And you've got to get onto this complete mobility thing, and you've got to make it seamless, and you've got to make it happen in the future. And you've got to do that together. Now, I hope that has been helpful for you. Um, as I say, I don't come here with a funny accent to uh, tell you what to do. That's not my job. But my job is to just float some ideas like Bob and say, okay, that's what's happening. That's how I see uh, the world. And you know, this city can dream dreams. And it did it before with, with the Canadian Pacific Railroad. That's the, the last flight driven it. As I would say, Craig Ellicott, I think some of you say Craig Election, is that right? Craig Ellicott in Scotland. Um, tremendous vision to do that. And although it's, a, it's supposed to be a John F. Kennedy, or it was a Bobby Kennedy quote, it was actually George Bernard Shaw, that's the quote that I love yeah, at the end. And that's the quote that I try to live my life with, and my professional life with. And I, I hope that it, uh, it's been helpful for you as well. Thank you very much. So I guess it's uh, call the personal mobility manager and pass the Vegemite, or something like that. Uh, we, we have uh, now, we have two responders, two mayors. Uh, the first is going to be Jeff Lehman from the mayor of, of Barry. He's a former academic, uh, he's an economist, worked a lot on transit, and he's been the mayor of Barry for 10 months. So. Well, good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me? Uh, now, who knows where Barry is? <laughs> Very good, excellent, yes. It's located about 90 kilometers north at the center of the universe. Uh, and uh, I, I'm the mayor of a city of 140,000 people. So my perspective on some of these issues is a little bit different because um, whereas we are increasingly integrated with uh, our urban region, the Greater Toronto, Hamilton, Greater Golden Horse, whatever you wish to call it, um, I have my own challenges in providing mobility uh, in a city that is of the size that it is and, and growing very rapidly. And those of you who know Barry will know that uh, not only do we get more snow than you do, but uh, it is growing very, very rapidly indeed. So one of the things that became a surprise issue in the election campaign last year uh, in Barrie was transit. And a surprise issue only because traditionally in our uh, kind of hierarchy of issues, transit doesn't rise to the top. Uh, but it rose near the top in this election campaign. There were eight candidates for mayor in Barrie. I was uh, very honored to win the office. And one of the things I said I would do is fundamentally change our transit system. Um, we, for 40 years, have run a bus-based system based on a single downtown point. Everything runs to that downtown uh, terminal. It's called a flower pedal system. 
uh, which meant that it's kind of like flying on Delta. You have to go to Atlanta to get anywhere else. In Barrie, you had to go downtown to get anywhere else. Um, we're now proposing, and I've just put online, so those of you with your smartphones, Barrie.ca, uh, there is a mayor's plan for transit, and it's a shift to a multi-hub system. We'll have multiple hubs around the city. And interestingly, two of those hubs are go rail stations. So to the uh, very good points made in the presentations tonight, the central theme of integrated mobility management. For uh, my people, uh, 32,000 of whom travel south to work, sorry, 30,000 of whom travel south to work every day. Interestingly, we have 32,000 who come into the city every day to work, but most of them are local and they're driving. And the 30,000 that are going out are coming to the GTA. And it's no surprise to any of you who uh, have lived in this region for any length of time, anywhere in the GTA, that the pattern of employment has fundamentally changed in our part of the world. It used to be uh, much more focused. Now employment has moved to the suburbs and into a built form that is very difficult, very difficult, to serve effectively with trends. And we, the collective we, have done a miserable job of adjusting our transportation, our public transit system, to serve the new land use pattern of employment. So today we are faced with the challenge that is exemplified in the big move of building those connecting cross uh, connections by transit that will allow somebody who lives in Barrie to get on my new transit system, get on Go Transit, get on an LRT on Highway 7 or Steeles or Finch or wherever it is, and go across to their employment in a suburban area of the GTA which is fundamentally a different trip than we've been trying to serve with Go Transit and frankly the TTC and even Barry Transit, which was focused in its own way on downtown Barry. So we put this uh, plan up online five days ago and we had a survey and the survey results I live update because I'm really obsessed about this plan. Uh, and it's, it's fascinating to watch the results and, and no surprise, uh, we have a question that says, do you think this increase in service will encourage more people to take Transit, 87% yes. Well, I hope so. Um, but interestingly, would no need to transfer a more rapid corridor service encourage you to take transit more frequently? Even more so, 90%. And this gets to the central point of what we're talking about tonight, which is understanding what individual needs are for travel. I think, um, you know, the, the application world, and we're going to launch our own app, um, which will uh, take the automatic vehicle locator technology, show you where the buses are on a moving map on your smartphone in areas uh, progressive cities have done already around the world. But we talked about those incentives and the individual choice for transportation. What if that same app could give you a choice of modes that could tell you, if you were interested, what the greenhouse gas emissions associated with each mode so you, you go on the smart map and you point to your destination, your phone already knows where you are, and it gives you five choices of ways to get there. You can walk, you can cycle, you can take a taxi, you can take a bus, and by the way, here are the routes, uh, or you can drive. And it'll give you that information. Uh, what are the greenhouse gas emissions? What is the cost? What is the time to get there? That's real power, and that level of information is possible. Now, if we want to incentivize travel, how about we tie a tax incentive to that or a tax rebate to that? What if we were able to actually take that information and the, the crude benefits that we've got today in terms of an income tax rebate for a monthly transit pass? Let's, let's do it in real time. That will be possible. And this gets to a broader point that I want to make, particularly in response to, to Professor Hazel, who's talking about incentives and how we are going to pay for uh, this enormous issue. Um, it's an easy answer for me to do it, and many mayors do. But I have to say, I'm an economist, which means I'm a terrible dinner party guest. But it also means I believe very, very strongly that this is at the core of one of our key national economic issues. And George showed the last fight uh, 125 years ago when a national vision produced a remarkable leap forward for our transportation system. We need it, again, at a national level. We have to have our friends in the federal government at the table to understand that this productivity issue, which is what it is, when congestion has reached the point that it has in Toronto, when it is hurting all of our economic progress to the point that it is today, it has to become an issue for the national government. 
And it has to be a national vision that helps us emerge from it because it's not just Greater Toronto. I was in Calgary, Mayor Denshi was part of our, our panel um, uh, this afternoon at the CUTICON. It is an issue in every large city across the country. It is most severe in our city, in, in, in Greater Toronto, uh, in our region. But it is fundamentally a productivity issue. And uh, as an economist, I believe it is the role of government to intervene to fix market failures. And we have a number of them that are hurting our quality of life and holding us back as a region. So it will require more than just mayors shouting for federal government and the federal government saying, mayors, you go fix it. Uh, it will require all of us to work together. But there is the opportunity for a national transit strategy now. There is the opportunity for a level of investment which will see a return. So even if you don't believe in the social reasons, even if you don't believe in the environmental reasons, there is an economic return. And the economic return is in overcoming that productivity gap we, we read about so often in the report on business section of the globe, but we don't always read about the other sections of the globe. And that can be uh, what our contribution can be as all three levels of government. So you bring that all right back to the individual and say that if we provide you the choice, if we have the vision to, uh, to invest, uh, will you respond? If we give you the choice, will you use it? And yes, we may need to incentivize it. I'd like to think we can do it through positive incentives, not just negative incentives, although probably a mix of both is appropriate. But if you use it, will you? If we provide it, will you use it? Well, the survey that we've got online says yes, and I fundamentally believe in it. So in my city of 140,000, I'm going forward and I'm gonna ask my city council for the capital and operating funding for 30% expansion in transit service. And we're going to do it. I firmly believe we're going to do it. And we've watched other cities like Oakville, Calgary, and others make that investment and see the return. And I, I firmly believe it is possible. But we can never forget the central message from both of your presentations tonight, I believe, which is that if we ever forget who the customer is and the fact that their needs are different, different than they have been in the past, then we will not be successful in seeing the return on investment. So the way in which we roll this out from the most granular things like shoveling snow at bus stops so that people can actually get on a bus uh, in the middle of our winter, right through to providing these new and very expensive connections that were on Professor Hazel's map, the, 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 the east-west connections that have never existed uh, in the, the north and west part of our region. All of that has to be part of the solution. And to do something that ambitious, we're going to need all three levels of government to work together. So, um, my response to you two gentlemen is you're bang on right, but we're going to need a big team and, a, and a, a renewed sense of vision around transportation in this region and in this country to accomplish it, which is a big goal, but one that I think many of us here believe in. So thank you for your presentation. Thank you for your time tonight. Transit operation in the GTA and a smart car that would allow us to use it. Uh, Think about where we are on that today. <laughs> First of all, we don't have integrated transit in the GTA. We have it in some parts of the GTA. Mississauga is integrated with Oakville, and Mississauga is integrated with Brampton, but we are not integrated with Toronto, which is really where the action actually is. Do we have a smart car? Well, the Presto card is coming. Do we have a rail link to the airport? I sat on three task forces to look at the rail link to the airport. And finally, it's going to happen. So you got to have faith in the future. You never give up. We fought with the federal government and the provincial government to get gas tax. We did it at the FCM for some 10 to 12 years. And finally, it happened. So never give up, folks. It really does happen eventually. Do I agree with mobility management? Why? How can you be, disagree with sliced bread? You can't. Excellent. But in the greater Toronto area, municipal boundaries have got to disappear for us to have integrated transit. It doesn't need, mean that the transit operations at the local level need to disappear but we need coordination. 
I sat on metalinks for some three to four years, and I was so delighted that finally the province had moved towards trying to put together the public transit needs of the GTA. Unfortunately, not enough authority was given to metalinks. For instance, land use is not their responsibility. And land use is so ba basic, so basic to developing a proper transportation plan. They are going to look at, we came up with a capital budget uh, three year, uh, uh, the three years I was on there, of a $30 billion budget, capital budget, capital budget, not operating capital budget to deal with the gap that exists in the GPA. I understand now it's at 50 billion. So where is the money going to come from uh, to build the infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, public transit only? They don't deal with roads, strictly public transit. And uh, they have been given direction by the province that by 2013 that they tell us how the money is going to be raised to invest in the $50 million gap that exists. John Tory called a meeting of the GTA mayors and regional chairs last Friday morning. And we have given a message to Metrolinx. We can't wait for 2013. It's got to happen in 2012. <laughs> we want to know what the methods are that we're going to raise the money, both provincially and federally and locally, to fund that $50 billion gap. Because quite honestly, ladies and gentlemen, it is now starting to affect the economic success of the greater Toronto area. Con congestion. I was down to Brazil on a trade mission with the greater Toronto area, promoting the greater Toronto area. Because the greater Toronto Market Alliance does that and does it fairly well. And we told them about all the great assets that we have in the greater Toronto area. And we do have wonderful assets here. We're close to the American border. We don't understand why companies from South America want to locate in Florida, far away from the economic engine of the United States, when we're within three hours of the economic engine of the United States, and so But thank goodness they didn't ask us about congestion in the future. Because <laughs> I would have had to be a little well, I don't know how I would have ducked the issue. <laughs> so we have all these assets, but we do not have. We can't move our goods or our people in the GTA. And it's so important that all the municipalities in the GTA work together. You know, our buses go from Mississauga to the subway, and we take 13,000 people every morning. Close doors as soon as we hit the Toronto boundary line. And close doors till we get back to the municipal boundary. So to get mobility management operation, there's a few things that, that happens before that. And that is to integrate transit in the GTA. You know, people that work in Markham and live in Mississauga, people work live in Mississauga and work in Scarborough. We are an economic unit, the greater Toronto area, and it is so important that we put our transportation needs together, that municipal boundaries disappear, that we provide the convenience to the people not to leave their cars at home and to use public transit. But you know, when you have to get off of one bus and get on another bus, because it's operated by another municipality, is not very convenient. <coughs> so I say to you, now, in order for us to fund, even with all the tools that Metrolinx is going to come forward with, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities for years has been saying to the federal government, 
you've got to have a transportation strategy for this great country of Canada. I was told this morning by a member of Parliament that they're working on it. That's a big hope. And that's good. That's good news. They're working on it. They haven't been working on it. So that's progress. They're working on it. So as when it will come forward, we're going to have to pressure to make sure it comes forward. Because the property tax cannot afford, cannot pay for what is needed to provide an integrated transit system in the GTA. The property tax was never intended to look after humans. It was intended to look after property. And it has social costs, health, and education on it at the present time. So it means the federal government has got to come forward and fund the transportation, their contribution to the transportation needs of the GTA and of all municipalities across Canada. It is so badly needed. The province has the move, has come up with Metrolinks that deals only with public transit, does not deal with roads, and there's got to be the mobility program is dealing with everything. Taxes, you name it, is dealing with everything. And that is what we need in the GPA. As to where the funding is going to come from, I'm looking forward, as we all are, the mayors and chairs of the GTA, as to what Metrolinx is going to recommend to the province and give us the answers to how this is going to be funded so we can, in turn, try to convince the people. But any funding that is raised must be dedicated to transit. If it's raised for transit, it can't go into the general funds of either the province, the federal government, or local government. It must be dedicated. I believe we can sell it on the basis that it's dedicated to provide a service for the people. Secondly, you've got to provide a service that is well managed, clean and convenient, even to the point, as the Mayor of Barry says, making sure the snow is cleared away from the bus shelters because we do have winter. But it, what we need is the mobility management plan after we are able to, to have municipal boundaries disappear and an integrated transit system for the GTA. Let's all get behind it. Let's pressure everybody to join us with this program of integration you know, we don't have it with the TTC. And think of the thousands of people that leave Mississauga every morning to come into Toronto. Thank God for the gold train that municipal boundaries don't exist. So folks, let's get on with, with the job that has to be done. I believe that people will buy into a system if we present it in a business-like way, as well as a as a commitment that whatever they are asked to pay, whether it's income tax, a special gas tax, a toll road or whatever, that it will go into transportation needs of the GTA. Let's get all behind it and pressure both our federal and provincial government to recognize that it cannot be done on the property tax. It just can't be done with all the other services that we must provide with the property tax. Thank you for your contribution, and let's get behind mobility management in the GTA to save us and to make us competitive with the rest of the world. Take the mayor's chair, chairs, and uh, then we're going to ask questions. You are going to ask questions. So why don't you come on up? And I want to ask the first question because that's what I get to do. Are you listening? The four of you, George, your worship, 
And I think there's one huge flaw in everything I've heard tonight, and that is that it assumes that people will do the right thing if they have the right information, if it's available for them to do, that somehow the people are rational, uh, and that people uh, will make the choices that we want them to make. And I would suggest that is completely wrong. Uh, and, and my evidence would be, is the man who would normally be sitting where you are right now. <laughs> A man whose first words upon being elected mayor of Toronto was, the war on the car is over. Those were his first words. Now, I think a lot of people knew that that's what he was thinking when they voted for him. And I think they voted for him for that reason. And I think that to underestimate the relationship that people, especially men, have with their cars is a big mistake. It's a, it's a, it's a deep emotional attachment that people feel. And, uh, and I'm not joking. And I think that it takes a lot more than the kinds of um, of, of measures we've been talking and we've heard about tonight, as, as wonderful and as welcome as they would be, I speak to you as a Metro Pass owner. So um, it's the truth. But uh, I'm in a minority, and the people who want that are in a minority. Most people um, don't understand the, the soul thing, where you cut down and you take down a, a freeway, and you don't add any more, more roads. You said, I think, uh, George, uh, traffic is like water, it finds its own level. Um, I don't think that that's kind of an argument that would hold much water, so to speak, uh, here in the GTA. Who wants to start? What I, what I, you misunderstood what I was saying. I was, I was agreeing with you, uh, in terms of what I was saying about understanding individual needs in the retailing one. You give people value, and if you give people value, people change. Because everybody, everybody wants value. Why do I have an Oyster car? Okay? Uh, you pay three pounds for this car, and I never had one. I only go, I only go to London maybe six times, six times a year. What, one of the guys at the ticket office said to me, well, why would you not have an Oyster car? I said, well, I don't want to pay three pounds. Scotsman, you know? <laughs> He said, hold on, with the Oyster car, a zone one fare is 1.50, and without it, it's four pounds 50, so you're going to pay three pounds anyway if you don't have the car on one ticket, and you only pay three pounds once. Said, okay, and you don't have to queue, and you can charge it up. Okay, that's a deal. That, that's why I've got an Oyster car. Why did the 50% of car drivers, like you're saying, weld it to their car? And I've got a TR6, I love cars. Why, why, um, why did they change? Because it was valued and it was more convenient to them uh, to change. So I think if you can. It's interesting, the number of people from this saga, by the way, I, I, I'm not going to give you numbers, that are coming to live in downtown Toronto because they want to get rid of their car. They can't do it in this saga but they can do it in Toronto. And uh, that, I don't think people are attached to their car. It, in Mississauga, I can only tell you the reason they're attached to their car, we don't have an adequate transit system. That's really it. And in fact, people are so anxious to live downtown, they're now buying condos that are as small as 301 square feet. That's a pretty high price to pay to live in downtown Toronto. But without a car. Yes. That's the great. That's seen as being the great advantage, but and that's obviously a trend that's happening. But I don't know that it's at the point yet where we can make the kinds of changes, uh, even have this kind of debate. Uh, at a, at a, uh, well, I guess we are having that kind of debate, but not <laughs> not outside the uh, not outside the boundaries of Toronto, unfortunately. And you know the way it is in this country. Uh, we basically, as the mayor of Mississauga has told us, I mean, we are basically hostages. Uh, there's no other word uh, of the federal and provincial governments who, who were quite happy to let us twist in the wind. Is somebody, um, Jeff? Is that on? Yes. It's, okay. Um, first of all, Chris, you're completely wrong, and your <laughs> deeply ingrained cynicism is matched only by my naive optimism. <laughs> <laughs> 
kind of plays out. I'm going to give you three things. First of all, The Onion. People know The Onion. It's a satirical newspaper. This, my favorite headline of all time was 97% of Americans approve of other people taking public transport. <laughs> How much is it married? It's There's greater truth to that, isn't there? Um, but here's what I'll give you uh, in, in contrary to, to your kind of position, which is that Oakville, Oakville Transit, two years ago, blew up their system. They rerouted all the buses. They added service. And in Oakville, the highest rate of car ownership in North America, Oakville, they increased ridership by 20% on transit. Buses. Percent of what? Okay, yeah. So 20% of That's the point. I, I would tell you, though, that the, the basic connection the basic connection between improved service and increased uh, transfer ridership is a proven fact, even in places like Oakville and Barrett. But, but now, now, now you're saying point. point, because if, if this is a proven fact, I've heard this debate many, many times. I've read this article many, many times too. We know that the Toronto, Toronto Board of Trade has said to us that we are losing six billion dollars a year in lost productivity because of congestion. I don't know how much clearer the argument can be made. But I'm saying to you that I sense that there is an attachment to the automobile that goes beyond logic, that goes beyond rational argument, that goes beyond even rational analysis. I remember hearing a guy here named R uh, Randall O'Toole. I don't know if you know him. He's a, a lunatic right here from Oregon, I think, who, whose argument was that the commute is for Americans, he was talking about Americans, not Canadians, is their favorite time of the day because they get to sit in, a, sit in a very comfortable leather seat or their bums are nicely warm listening to our pretty good stereo drinking <coughs> coffee and they're all alone. And as long as it's not more than 25.69 minutes, then they're happy. That's the problem. But it is, and that's the problem. <laughs> that's the problem. Yeah. Shall we open it up to the, uh, to, to the audience here? Yes. The man in the blue shirt. Yes, we have a microphone, and please, can we have questions, not uh, declarations, uh, <laughs> not manifestos, okay? Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I want, this isn't a, a declaration, but I just want to say to the first speaker, Rabob, that you think we're ahead of you. Well, we might used to have been ahead of you, but I, <laughs> I, I don't think that's the case anymore. Um, just, just to follow up on what Christopher Newman was saying, um, it's, not, it's not just the attachment to the car, which we know is real, but there seems to be a real lack of will on the, pe on the people who make decisions about, uh, about infrastructure, about transit. You know, we're talking about a $50 billion deficit now in infrastructure. How can we explain that uh, kind of lack of will that we're seeing? Uh, and everybody knows what you thought, I mean, we've been hearing this now for decades about the car, going, going back to Buckminster Fuller and Paul Goodman and Moshe Safdie back in the 60s and 70s. And we know all this, but this lack of will still seems to exist. But I just want to say one optimistic point, which I haven't heard come up yet, and uh, what causes people to stop the, the madness of the car. Let's remember, Toronto did stop the Spadina Expressway in the 1970s, and that was the first time that's ever happened in North America. In fact, that's what brought Jane Jacobs up to the city. So I think there are other reasons, there are other political um, motivations and, and events that can cause these things to happen. Well, there's sort of a question in there, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, lack of will. 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 Yes. On behalf of the dis lack of will on behalf of the decision maker? Well, there was a federal election just a short while ago, and there was a provincial election. I followed it very closely, and at no time did the public raise with those running for office infrastructure needs, transportation needs, or public transit needs. So until the public grasps, grasps the need and gives the message through uh, to the federal and provincial government that they we cannot provide the transportation needs with all the other infrastructure needs of the municipality on the property tax. Because of every dollar you pay in taxes, 90 cents goes to the provincial and federal government, and 
is kept by local governments to provide all the services that you enjoy every day. Yes, sir. Anybody who wants to ask a question, head over to the to the young woman with the microphone. That's your question. Uh, first of all, um, I have a question and a comment. Uh, my comment is to Mr. Hume. I feel quite uh, disappointed by your comment about uh, people driving cars. I don't drive a car. I take transit to work. I used to drive my car, but it died. Uh, and next time I have money, I will buy a car because it will save me a third of the time. Uh, it's not about ration irrationality. Uh, there are other. Uh, I, I feel that you strengthen my intelligence, okay? Uh, I've been accused my, of that before. <laughs> uh, and, and, and this is this time is justified. I don't know what the other time. Um, anyway, and my, and my right. question is, is uh, we see everywhere uh, cities talking about new transportation plans, and it's always transit, 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 transit. I really sh believe there is a market for transit, but is there also a market for roads? And just as Mayor uh, his McAllen uh, mentioned, there has to be an integrated plan of transit and new roads. Okay? So we cannot just say transit, transit only. It has to be new roads as well. People are willing to pay for that, for new roads with toll. Okay? Where? Corridors in Toronto, hydro corridors, highway corridors, rail corridors, you cannot be double deck or tunnel. We can talk, we can discuss for hours about this thing, but I, I'm, I think this is strongly ideological the bias against cars. So there has to be some consideration about people who have to drive cars because they go, they, they live in Markham and they, and they live in Mississauga. For net, for so what's your question? That we need more Why do we, don't we have a plan that considers road construction? All right. It's yes. already there. It's not enough. I think, I think that you'll find, uh, if you, especially in the United States, if you look at areas that have found the political will to raise resources to invest in transportation, that they by and large always have proposed a plan and a scheme which involves both road and transportation improvements and often cases even sort of municipal level and, and very localized level transportation and road improvements as well as transit. I think these things as a political reality get sold as a package, not as a single mode solution to things. So, uh, I think you're you're right that there's there's more to be gained by having a sort of multimodal scheme to look at the transportation network than to have a, a one mode scheme. Can, can we also not fall into the trap of this mode thing again? But the, the whole thing I was trying to say is mobility management is about the whole system. I'm a car driver. I have a I have a bike. I walk. I take transit. Um, and, and that's my life, and that's the life of most people in cities. And I use the car when I need to use the car, and I use transit when I need to use transit. The whole point of the mobility management system is that it will manage all of that for me, and if I need a taxi, I can use a taxi if it takes me to transit, or it takes me to the car, the parking right site, then that's fine. It's managing all of that. So car, car bad, public transport good, debate is, is sterile. We've got to get away from that. And, and look at the needs of individuals and joining, joining all of that up with the strategic needs for the, for the city. And that's what new technology can offer. Uh, and that's, that's where we've got to my, my name is Raymond Chu, and I, actually I'm the city councillor here from Toronto. And I'd like to thank all the speakers and moderator. I, I totally agree with all the presentation. My question is, Everybody said we need money from federal government, and federal government, as we know, the most important issue is a crime bill, not the <laughs> transportation. <laughs> They're saying that uh, we don't deal with the municipalities. Uh, you have to work with the province because uh, we work with the provincial government. 
So we turn to the province, you know, we don't have money, we have so much debt. So we have all the good presentation theory, we know what we need, it, but city, we don't have money. How can we get the money from federal government and provincial government to have this uh, uh, integrated uh, transportation plan and implement them? That's my practical question. So I, I need some advice from the mayors and the president. For a number of years. It took us 12 years, 12 years, to get the federal government to agree to give us fuel tax, but we won. Uh, it's not enough by any means, but at least it's now confirmed by this government that it will remain. We wondered that a change of government would we retain the gas tax. Not fuel tax, only gas tax. They were smart. We don't get it on diesel. Uh, uh, the provincial government is giving us gas tax. So we're making progress, as I said, never give up. But it's not sufficient. <coughs> And it's for public transit. Uh, in some areas, they in the rural areas of Ontario, they're looking at it for roads because they don't have public transit. It's not sufficient. What we need is the public behind the, our issue of getting the federal government to provide the necessary funding. The stimulus program that came forward, as you know, to try to create jobs. It was a wonderful, pro pro a wonderful program for the municipalities. We spent $92 million in Mississauga on roads and other uh, facilities for the city. But it's a one-shot deal, and now it's disappeared. We don't know what's coming. We need a sustainable source of revenue, the municipalities across this country, for infrastructure needs, of which transportation is a part of it, and a very important part. It's up to the public to convince the federal members. You have federal members in Toronto, like I have in Mississauga. We met with them at 7 o'clock this morning, <coughs> telling them what the needs are of Mississauga in regard to infrastructure funding. So it's up to the public to let their voice be heard in the federal oh. government that we need the federal government participation in providing the infrastructure needs. The infrastructure needs of the cities in Canada right now is $160 billion. That is what the Federation of Canadian Municipalities have established. And that's based on thorough research by individual accounting firms to come up with it and a survey of the, all the municipalities across Canada. We have a big gap in regard to infrastructure funding of which transportation, both roads and uh, public transit is a part. The only project that Canada has built in the last number of years, I don't want to name the number of years, is the bridge to, New, to Prince Edward Island. That's the only major project that the federal government has built in the last number of years. Thank you very much. Who's next? Well, I'd like to ask a question of Mr. Stanley and what of Mr. Abel. Yeah, but they're really one of the same question because they relate to one uh, snow clearing of uh, which uh, Mr. Stanley spoke and uh, Mr. Hazel, uh, a uh, sort of vice president. It's really one and the same question because it goes back to the construction of roads when highways were built and people required licenses to operate vehicles. Snow clearing is done to the curb. We have uh, an accumulation of snow, and so we have the problem of winter turning snow turning to ice. Why do we not, in the construction of our roads, do our snow clearing to the center where snow immediately upon falling on a warm surface will liquefy. And in the center we'll have a grid for traffic coming coming both ways. So that we would no longer clear snow to the outside, we would clear snow to the inside. And the second question, and that has to do with the construction of our roads. Our roads are not constructed properly. 
and neither are uh, roads uh, constructed for the use of bicycles. Bicyclists uh, should, uh, and their operators, be required to be licensed. Their vehicles should be required to be licensed. Because a road should, should they be licensed too? I'm sorry. What, what about people in wheelchairs? Should they be licensed too? Beg your pardon. I'm hard to hear. Uh, no, but I don't. Uh, I don't. I travel on the sidewalk. Oh, you're talking about. Okay, let's get to the question, shall we? <laughs> I don't travel on the. I don't travel on the road with my uh, walker. I'm speaking. The bicyclist is traveling as a freeloader and doesn't have recognition. That's right. We don't pay. I'm a bicyclist. We don't pay to uh, uh, endorse the upkeep of the road. So why should they be on the road? All right. Uh -oh. So there's the question. Why should they be on the road? Does anybody want to take on that one? And we should have different roads. I think bicycles. Uh, I think if, if on our roads, if we can set aside the the uh, space that's required, I don't think we do that very well. The space that's required for a bicycle. Then what's the problem with allowing people? Because we don't have snow uh, that many months during the year, and I see people in Mississauga, uh, believe it or not, in the winter time riding a bicycle. They must be so we must give them the opportunity. <laughs> okay. Yes. My question is for uh, Mayor McCallion. I was very interested in your point about GTHA may mayors trying to push Metrolinx to advance their funding thing in 2012. Because uh, money's the root of all of our challenges, both investment and service coordination and all the stuff that you talked about. So with your brilliant uh, political antenna, and uh, do you think there's a chance that that's going to happen because I I even heard rumors the other way that Metrolinx may delay their uh, requirement to come up with funding tools by 2013 to 2014. So how what do you think are the chances that you'll act that they actually will come up with something meaningful by 2012 or early 2013? Well, we have a member of the Metrolinx in the audience today. And he, uh, where are you, George? And he's assured me tonight, as I discussed it with him, indicating whether or not they're going to wait till 2013. I reported to him what the mayors and regional chairs said last Friday, that we wanted in 212, and we wanted as quickly as possible. Because first of all, we have to review it, we have to assess it, and then buy into it, and then right. sell it to our people. So uh, he's assured me that they're going to do it that they'll have all the data ready for the first six months of 212. Is that right? I don't know. This is not on, but uh, <laughs> uh, Hazel and I had a brief discussion uh, earlier, and uh, you know, it's now or never. 2012 is the time we need to get our act together and move all this stuff forward. So, you know, uh, we're going to work real hard at that, and the tools are there. As Hazel says, the public has to get behind us. We've got to solve this. But may I make a comment? I mean, you, you started off your question by saying that the root of all our problems is money. And I suppose that's true. But we do have money, and we have lots of it. We have it for jails, or we're about to. <laughs> we have it for a variety of other causes. So there's lots and lots of gazebos and... and, and <laughs> but, so there's lots and lots of money around. This is the wealthiest city in, in Canada that, that we're in here tonight. Um, so I, I wonder if the question, if the issue really is money, or is it our willingness to spend it on the way that we So listen, so we have one last question. It's, it's almost 9 o'clock. Sir, you have the last question. Thank you. Make it short. <laughs> I'm on this truck. <laughs> like in the mechanic. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I was so pleased to hear 
the mayor from Delhi for the first time saying greenhouse gases. All cities are greenhouse producers. And it's a global problem. We have to also think of that. Nobody seems to worry about the global problem that we are creating. <coughs> anyway, since there is a, um, the mayor very uh, rightly said that property tax is not on which we can burden everything. I have another way of raising tax, and it's called gas tax. We all pay it. All I'm saying is, if we have a progressive income tax, which is slowly going down, why don't we have a progressive gas tax? That bigger cars, more powerful cars, pay more gas tax. And that way, we can raise another stream of taxes, which will clear up, clean up the environment, and give money for public transit. The Federation of Canadian Municipalities and the municipalities across this country asked the federal government that rather than reducing the GST, which they did, to give it to the municipalities to fund the infrastructure. And they refused to do it. GST, two points of the GST, would build all the infrastructure across this country of Canada. And I think maybe now the federal government would like to have that 2% for right off the deficit. I mean, a very quick point. We all know at some point carbon pricing is going to happen. I mean, it's just, a, it's going to happen. You go to Alberta right now, Alberta of all places, you can trade carbon credits at the moment. Um, uh, what I was saying about the, the choices of travel by road and, and the potential to tie in some way an incentive, I mean, and this was the second thing I never got to say to Chris, was do incentives work? Look at Groupon. Of course they work. Now, Groupon is a positive incentive. There are negative incentives as well. But my point is, at some point, we're going to have the technology and the ability, if we want to, if we have the political will, to um, put carbon pricing right at the level of, of individual travel choices. We already do it in very crude ways with things like offsets and flights and, and those sorts of things. But it's not a core part of a financing strategy or, or a system of taxation in this country. I believe in 10 years from now it will be. I don't know what it will look like, but I believe it can be one way that we use that tremendous power of incentives uh, to help shape behavior and travel choices, to better reflect the true costs uh, of transport. Can, can I just add one thing and encourage you to, to look broadly? You're going to need every income stream that there is. To, to solve this problem, because because you know there's so much ground to be made up. And sure, you need federal money. Sure, you need provincial money. But there's a whole range of other methods that places around the world have used that hopefully Metrolinx is going to look at. That you need to look at. You know things like land uplift capital, things like the, um, the, the revenue streams from smart infrastructure, advertising, stored value, all of that kind of stuff. You'll need it all. And so you know, don't just go to the public sector. You know, think really largely, think widely uh, to, to solve this problem because you're going to need it all. Yeah, you could always have bake sales and have craft <laughs> sales. Really good too. Thank you very, very much for coming. Please go. Thank you. Thank you.